Welcome to the Ag Emerge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Bottens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks so much for joining us. Today, we welcome Dino Giacomazzi, the CEO of Giacomazzi Almond Company and the fourth generation to manage his family's farm, founded in 1893 by his Swiss-Italian great-grandfather. The operation consists of 700 acres of almonds, 300 acres of corn, wheat, and alfalfa. Oh yeah, and two miniature donkeys. Dino talks with us about his farming journey, including family farming identities, industry dynamics, new opportunities, and the different pressures that affect changing farming practices and improvements. He and Monty also discuss the excitement and challenges of engaging the next generation in the paradigm-shifting business of agriculture. Monty and Dino explore everything from dairy to almonds to cover crops, and they dive into some of the pressure points like water regulations as well as labor and environmental factors affecting farming operations. It's a great conversation, so let's jump right in. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of the Ag Emerge podcast. Today, I'm joined by a friend and fellow farmer, Dino Giacomazzi from Hanford, California. Welcome, Dino. I'm sure glad you could take the time to be here. Well, thank you, Monty. Happy to be here. Uh, Looking forward to it. I guarantee you today we're going to have a lot of fun. Uh, Dino and I like to uh, spar a little bit, have a little fun with each other, make a little fun of each other. (laughs) So... uh, this one might be best uh, enjoyed with a cold adult beverage uh, as you listen to this one, but preferably not while you're driving down the road. So anyway, Dino, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, your your farming history and, and kind of where you started and, and where you've come to today and, and kind of backfill a little bit of the, of the why behind it, if you would. Sure. Um, well, my name, as you said, is Dino Giacomazzi. I'm a fourth generation farmer in Hanford, California. I, I used to say I'm a fourth generation dairy farmer in Hanford, California, but um, uh, in 2019, we sold our, our milk cows. Um, after milking cows continuously every single day uh, from 1893 until uh, 2019, it's about 100, 126 years milking cows. And, um, you know, we were, we were dairy farmers, so we also farmed in addition to the dairy, and we have been growing almonds since uh, 2014 and uh, grow corn, wheat, alfalfa, um, <clears throat> other forage crops for local dairies, and uh, this year embarking on, on a new endeavor and trying our hand at growing processing tomatoes. Very good. So no lack of variety. Yes, no lack of variety. <laughs> One of the things I think is really interesting, and you and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago, is you said you used to call yourself a dairy farmer. Now you call yourself a farmer. And talking about that identity and what that means, what, what's it been like for you to go through that, that identity transition, essentially, from you know, a dairyman, the fourth generation dairyman, 126 years of the family dairy, to... Um, you know, permanent crops and, and row crops. Talk about that feeling that, that you've had to go through. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll go back a little bit and talk somewhat about, you know, just not just me, but sort of my whole family, right? Because it's really a family identity issue more than it is just a me issue. Absolutely. And, and, you know, my, I, I wanted to sell our cows in 2014, um, at, at the time, you know, I had some insight, uh, when, uh, Europe was, um, going to remove their quotas, essentially lifting their supply restrictions. And I had a sense that, you know, the dairy industry was going to be difficult, uh, to make money, uh, for some time. Turned out that was true. Uh, at the time, 2014, you know, cows were worth a lot of money. Milk was worth a lot of money. It was a really, really good year for dairy. And, you know, so I went to my 
my family. And I said, Hey, let's, let's sell these cows now and get out of this business before it's too late. And, and the answer at that time was basically that, well, we need to stay in the dairy until you're, as long as your grandmother is alive, you know? And my grandmother at the time was over a hundred years old and, and she made it to 105. Okay. And she passed away um, in the end of 2018, mm-hmm. which cleared, uh, you know, one of the hurdles to, you know, transitioning out of mm-hmm. milking cows. And then I went to my mother and, and said, you know, hey, today we're in a situation we ought to look at selling these cows. And, you know, and this is somewhat tongue in cheek. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a game I continue to play with her, which is she said, well, you know, I don't really want to sell the cows because I like looking out my window and seeing cows out there. Right. <laughs> so I went uh, and plowed down the cornfield behind her house and put up a fence and planted pasture mm-hmm. and uh, put cows in my mom's backyard. OK, you so, you home. know, <laughs> solved solved the problem of cows outside the back window. Right. And, uh, but we, you know, we, 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 we went through it and, you know, and I, I think my mother's, one of my mother's issues, I believe is because my mom was very, very involved in the dairy community. And, and, and certainly here in California, the community that is dairy is much, much different than anything else. You know, there isn't really an almond community there's no cotton community, you know, there's, you know, there is nothing like that. You know, there's thousands of almond farmers all over the place. There's not like the almond princess and, you know, we're not all at the fair together doing these almond things, you know, like, like, like dairy not showing your almonds, you know, yeah, not showing, the- not walking <laughs> our almonds, you know, I mean, we're not traveling all over the country going to these, alm- you know, I mean, there is really a deep, uh, culture and, and kinship, you know, between dairy farmers and, you know, and, and, and while certainly that I would say there are subcultures of dairy out here, you know, you kind of have different, it's sort of broken out by different ethnic groups to some degree. Sure. They're still really, really close. Like everybody knows everybody. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you're, you're an outsider. You're not part of the two major groups. I'm, I'm the Brown Swiss, right? I'm the, I'm in, I'm in the all other breeds. I'm in the all other breeds other class. Breeds. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't have as much competition. You know, I always win my uh, class because I'm the only guy in it. But but uh, but anyway, so you know, with my mom, she was involved in the June Dairy Month thing and the Dairy Princess Committee and the Dairy This and the Dairy That and all these dairy things, right? And this is her her scene. Her you know, this is her community. And um, and so I, I you know I think there there's where the real identity crisis existed right it's like if I'm not a dairy woman how do I participate in the dairy women organization and you know what ended up happening is that she's still in the dairy women organization she's still working to support the dairy princess still on the June Dairy Month committee along with 20 other women who sold their cows in the last you know. 10 or 15 years, right? So, you know, it is not uh, necessary to be in dairy anymore to be in the dairy community, you know. Um, and, and the same has been with me, right? I mean, I have a lot of friends in dairy and all of those people are still my friends and we still, you know, do things. And I, I also had a kind of a long hangover from um, getting out of dairy because in the middle of um, a, 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 a year or so before I decided to sell the cows, a, a, a problem in the California dairy industry popped up over a pricing mechanism known as quota in, you know, California dairy pool quota. And for some unknown reason, I inserted myself very deeply into that issue and, uh, and, and became somewhat the central figure around trying to bring the industry together uh, to come up with a solution. And, and that problem didn't really, my role in that didn't really end until this year in June. So, you know, I spent uh, a lot of, you know, and, and, and yesterday, it's, it's quite interesting that today we had this podcast because yesterday was the two year anniversary of us selling our cows. Oh. And today is my father's birthday. So 
you know, it's um, it's a special day. So thanks for uh, you know spending it with me, Monty. Well, I I appreciate being able to do that, and it, it's really interesting how you mentioned the the cultural community, the interactions, the the family orientation of the dairy uh, <laughs> sector, dairy industry. I think that in my observation in California, that's completely different than anywhere else. I really think the dairymen are trying to, even though there is some competition, you know, when we get into a quota situation or we get into, you know, being able to build new facilities because of limited resources, uh, you know, when we're trying to purchase silage or, or those kind of things, there's some limited resources. Yes, there's some competition, but overall, there's much more information sharing. Like if you have something good that's happening, you're, you're likely to tell all of your, your friends and dairymen to help them be better, okay? Take the produce industry, on the other hand, <laughs> or the grape industry. I mean, there's people signing NDAs to where you cannot, you know, share any information with each mm -hmm. other or everybody's, you know, very quiet about what works for them because they want that to be their competitive advantage. So to me, it is a, it is a very different orientation and, and it's something that's special and, and it's sad to see, you know, the market changing, but uh, change always happens, right? And yeah. you know, like they say, if you don't change, uh, change will happen to you. So mm -hmm. um, that, that's quite a quite a thing that you've gone through. And, and it's interesting how you've got full-blown almond and row crop hat on now, and you're still just finishing up the, the quota-related issue. So um, see, now you're free. You're, you're, you're I free, am free to be the, the nut and, and row crop yeah. farmer <clears throat> that you're that you're moving toward. I, I will add I will add a little bit of uh, color to that thing, too. Right. And that, and that is that um, it you know, even I've been out of dairy now for two years, but it took me almost an entire year to get over the feeling that something was going wrong. You know, it, it's a, it is a, you know, it is, it, it is such a weird thing, you know, for me, like in your decision to do that, or you're just like worried that kind of the every day to day at the dairy, what, what's, what's wrong today? Is that you know, I, I mean, I think, yes, when, when you're, when you're in dairy and you have a 24, seven, 365 right. operation of thousands of beating hearts and, 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 you know, tens of humans 24 hours a day where there's always something going wrong, right? And there's always something breaking down. There's something wrong with a cow. Somebody's not showing up to work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so you live within this world, you know, you live in this mentality of what's wrong. And, and you're always on call. And you're always on call. And, you know, you wake up on Sunday morning at the same time you wake up on Saturday and you come down here, whether there's something down here to do or not, it's just sort of like, habit in it's ingrained it's habit yeah and 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 i never really knew how how deep that was you know like in my personality until like a year later when i'm like here on a on a weekend sitting in my office and i'm like why the hell am i here like what am i waiting what am i waiting for to happen right mm -hmm. you know and 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 and, 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 and it was like yesterday you know yesterday was a monday and I didn't have a single person employed on that day because it rained and I sent everybody home, you know? So there was like literally a day off, you know, because it rained and, and on a dairy, you know, when it rains, it's, it's, it 10 X is all your problems, you know? <laughs> so it was, it was, you know, it was sort of like getting over that something's not wrong. So it's kind of freed me up to think about like, what's right, you know, focusing, you know, spending more focus on what's going right than, uh, what could be going wrong? How do you think you could help uh, dairymen now that you've kind of been through this, for lack of a better word, recovery process and, and realizing that, how could you help active dairymen discover a little more about what's right in what they're doing? Because hmm. they're, they're living in that moment of constantly what's, what's going to, what's next, you know? You thought about that? <laughs> I haven't thought about that, you know, I, I'll, I'll give that some thought, you know, but, but, I, but I will tell you that it's, you know, with COVID happening and, and, and the way the world has changed, mm -hmm. the, 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 the issues that I was dealing with two years ago are much, much worse now, mm -hmm. you know, they're much worth it works. I mean, supply issues, supply issues la labor. labor, labor is the bit, you know, I, I, I really was happy to get out of dairy mostly because of labor. It wasn't about, you know, losing a lot of money because, you know, we could have probably stuck it out. We could have invested money and, 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 and made the business more efficient. Um, 
but it really came down to labor. You know, it was it was so difficult finding people to work, particularly in my place, because it was an old dairy, flat barn, open corrals. You know, I mean, nobody wanted to work here. And, um, you know, so I could have built a carousel and that could have maybe solved a little bit of the problem. But at the end of the day, nobody wants to work on dairies. You know, nobody wants to work out here on the farm doing easy work. You know, it's 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 not um, you know, it hasn't gotten better. Um, it's easy for me, um, fortunately, because, you know, we went from 21 employees down to seven and um you know, and, and all of my employees that I have right now have been with me for 15 to 41 years, mm -hmm. you know, and, and so, you know, and, and, and as these guys are starting to retire out, cause I've got, you know, I've had one guy retire and another guy who's about to retire. And one guy who was a 40 year employee who died of COVID, you know, we, we've actually been, you know, considering scaling down a little bit, um, in terms of like what we're doing, you know, like we, we took on, when I sold the, the cows, I took on, you know, a lot of equipment and, and, and made it, made a decision that I'm going to keep all my people employed all year long and I'm going to do everything myself. So we, you wanted to be able to worry about something breaking. Yes, you didn't, exactly. You didn't want to let that part. Go, I, I right? didn't. I, yeah, exactly. You know, I mean, I, 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 you know, instead of having, you know, uh, farming services, you know, you want to be out there beating on stuff in the middle of the night. Yeah, we want to be out there, you know, with uh, bearings breaking and you know, engines exploding and things catching on fire. Like, you know, th but those are fun problems. You know, you sure. you have you have those problems, and you know, the tractor's on fire. You go, eh, we'll just we'll just come back tomorrow and we'll deal with it. It's right? not like you got to get it fixed in an hour to keep that string going. Uh, up, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, these are all, these are all good problems to have. <laughs> I'm happy to have those problems, but oh uh, yeah, but you know, from a, I think for what's right, you know, um, for dairy guys, <clears throat> um, you know, I, I think what's going really well for dairy right now is the, uh, you know, the methane uh, issue, right? I think, I think that, if your dairy is set up <clears throat> properly and you can do uh, a digester and sell the gas, uh, that the gas is is right now worth more than the milk. You know, I mean, uh, I mean, if you're if you're if you want to be an energy company, having uh, milk as a byproduct isn't an entirely terrible way of doing it. You know, um, I I think that you know, there's, I think with everything else that's going on, that the manure is becoming more valuable in a lot of ways, you know, the compost is becoming more valuable, but, you know, so I, so I think economically dairy is going to be sustainable. Yeah. If, if the right, you know, things are put in place, but it's still the regulatory stuff, the, the lack of labor that, you know, this is still, you know, I'm not sure what to find that's right in there. It's all, all of my dairy friends are always asking me if I know somebody, they can milk cows, right? I think it's yeah. interesting what you say there about looking at the dairy and different revenue streams instead of as milk, you know, and you kind of jokingly said milk is a secondary as the, as the waste stream uh, to make the methane. And, you know, there will be years like this where natural gas prices yeah. are skyrocketing and, and greenhouse carbon credits are going to come into this more and more. But also, like you said, manure is one of those exports that we've had for a long time that's of high value to organic producers and the dairyman himself. But I think there's there's also the opportunity in the whole beef sector with sex semen, looking at what we can do. We can take our best genetics and do, you know, herd improvement with the uh, cows and sex semen, and then the other ones we can we can do beef embryos and, and get a lactation cycle out of them and and create you know calf sales when the when the beef market's good. So I mean that's a it's yeah far more than just milk anymore, isn't it? To, yeah, dairymen. <clears throat> Absolutely. You know, I mean, we, you know, we, I, I you know, every, the dairy industry is really good at, at developing technology designed to lower milk price. Right. And, and it, and it takes a while for things to equalize, but eventually we figure out how to use it. Right. And the sex semen is one of those, right? Like sex semen has probably been radically changed the dairy <clears throat> industry. It, it, it was, but initially nobody knew what to do with it. So all they did was, 
create heifers, right? Let's just create all the heifers we can. Heifer, 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 heifers, right? Heifers, 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 heifers. Well, there was too many heifers, right? Then there was this shortage of beef and beef went sky high. We're like, well, we could use this to make beef too, right? So, you know, now now I think that it's, it's, it's finding some equilibrium, right? Like the guys that are doing it, right? I mean, back when Holstein bulls are worth $10, you can get 200 for a Holstein Angus cross, you know? That really drove a lot of... Uh, a lot of people to really think about it, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and those economic incentives are really what I think help, you know, transform these industries. You know, I mean, you, you and I have been around long enough doing strip till and, 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 and asking the question, you know, over, I mean, how many times did we, were we confronted with this idea? How do we get people to adopt, you know, these strip till practices, you know, and it's Show like, well, money. <laughs> yeah, you got to make it the most profitable thing to do, right? right. If it's not profitable, it ain't going to happen. Oh, and, and especially, so. I mean, the labor availability goes into that profitable too. Okay. So if we can take labor out of the equation, you know, do you anticipate labor rates going down in the future, Any? You know, no, they're going to, they're going to skyrocket. And yes. so it's all those things that what may be a, a break-even trade today, you got to look at what's their future potential. Right. In any practice that you do, don't, no matter if it's strip till or some other thing is where are, you know, regulatory pressures and labor pressures, environmental pressures, where we're, where we're heading, right. To try to, try to aim and, um, uh, at the target where it's moving. One that we talked a little bit ahead of time. One of those things that's moving is, uh, water in California. It's mm-hmm. always been the perpetual, you know, whiskey's for drinking and water's for fighting, right? And uh, that saying's been around for hundreds of years Mm -hmm. and and it's becoming more and more realistic. Now where you're at, you're in a water district, but also use groundwater. So every, uh, for our listeners out there that maybe aren't familiar with California, every area has a different groundwater basin that is based on where it recharges from and how, what its recharge rate is and such that they're looking at trying to figure out how to not over pump these various aquifers and basins uh, along with every piece has different surface water rights. Some have none, some have very junior high price, low volume rights. And then some have right across the fence, high abundance, low cost rights. So where do you see what, what's changing there? And it's, it's changing rapidly, huh? Well, yes. I mean, I, I will first start by saying that, you know, it, it's impossible to start to describe what the problem with water is in California because it's such a diverse issue, right? Yeah, we, like you, you have a five-day time slot uh, available on this podcast. So, oh, let's do it. Let's yeah, do it. Yeah. Okay, let's let's start with Southern California. Okay, <laughs> Southern California gets water from the Colorado River. Um, <clears throat> you know. Um, anyway, there. You know what's happening. What's really happening right now in California is that we. In 2014, there was a regulation passed that essentially says that we um, cannot overdraft our aquifers. And they gave us a timeline from which to implement, um, you know, first time to create these agencies that are going to oversee it. They divided the state up by um, these, you know, watershed sort of authorities. And then broke them up into sort of sub regions, and so then they had to, they formed all that, uh, and then they had to come up with a plan. You know, th- this last year, everyone, all those agencies had to come up with a plan. Some of those agencies' plans included starting right now, implementing cutbacks in terms of groundwater pumping, and some of them. Uh, I'm trying to keep this as G rated as possible. Uh, so I'm not we sure how to just disc- little, we have the little button we can poke. These. Oh, you can bleep Don't it. Worry. We can, right. we can yeah. bleep you okay. out. Okay. Well, some of them have had their heads up their donkeys. Okay. We'll just put it that way. <laughs> and, and had a, uh, let's just say a pie in the sky, um, uh, attitude about solving this problem sometime in the future. Right. So, I'll give you an example. In my and in, in one of the areas I farm in, and I actually farm across two different um, you know watersheds. Okay, uh, and in fact, the line sort of splits me. You know, I'm right on the peripherals of this these two sheds. <clears throat> and um, anyway, they they had a plan to overdraft 
um, our aquifer by 80,000 acre feet per year over the next 10 years. Okay, so they were going to include that, you know, in a sort of a, of a, of a ramp ramped in or, you know, a, a, a staged process to implement a regulation where we would be overdrafting and then not overdrafting and then it would come into some sort of balance, right? Well, that allow you to pump in the dry, because what happens is generally we pump harder in drier years that has less surface water. So, mm -hmm. right, the, the groundwater goes down really bad in, in dry years, and it takes, depending on how close you are to the mountains, right, one to three years for it to kind of catch up. But the problem is we don't see that catch up these days. Well, we don't. And, you know, and then, and then the regulations are designed in, in such a way that, you know, you're supposed to look at a five-year, you know, um, average. and Pulling average. Yeah. But, 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 but as it, however that part goes, this particular part is that they, you know, the amount of over, they looked back at like just say the last 10 years and it said, okay, we, we overdrafted by 800,000 acre feet in the last 10 years. So we expect to overdraft 800,000 acre feet in the next 10 years. We're going to include that in the in the count, right? Well, that's the standard. And, yeah, it, it it is. Except for except for, we did that in two years. Oops. Okay, we overdrafted eight hundred thousand acre feet last year and this year. Combined four hundred thousand four hundred thousand per year. We hit our ten year overdraft expectation in two years. You're an overachiever. Overachiever, yes, we are. We are really making it happen down here. So, yeah. so as you would imagine, there, you know, we'll 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 deal with it down the road. Attitude turned into a panic attitude, and now they are in a panic to um, restrict us. And so they have released a, um, a draft of a plan. Um, the draft of the plan is a you know a multi-tiered. Um, sort of a plan. And, and I don't know if how much you want me to shock your, you want me to give you numbers and scare the hell out of people. Go for it. All right. So, so this is what they're they're This is what we're looking at in one of, in one of my areas now, and this is an area, mind you, that has no surface water rights. Correct. This is, this is an area. Well, the only way that these perennial crops or any crop can grow is based on groundwater. Groundwater. That's it. We have no so other your, way to get water. Land value is 100% in your production capacity. And, and what we, and, and we get rain for free. Okay. The rain that falls on, is free oh, yeah. all six inches mm -hmm. yep we got one point you know one just yesterday so You're let's we can do that 10 more yeah. times um anyway the so the plan is you get 10 inches of water for free okay the second 10 inches you're going to pay a hundred bucks for those 10 inches not 100 in bucks in addition to the pumping costs in addition to pumping, this is this is this is a tax to the base. This is a, a this is a tax. Yes, yeah. so we will pay to the base, and I'll tell you after what they plan to do with it. I'm sure. Um, so the second, so the so the first ten is free. Second ten, one hundred dollars. The 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 next ten, so up to thirty uh, inches, you pay two hundred an acre for. The next 10 inches. Mm -hmm. After 30 inches, you pay by the inch based on a $500 an acre foot rate. And every inch you go over 30 is deducted off of your first 10 for next year. Oh, so you, yeah, you're paying it forward. Hey, yeah. <laughs> so oh, if, if you, <clears throat> okay. So if you use 40 inches this year, mm -hmm. you're going to pay for, you know, 100 for, for 20 to 30, 200 for 30 to 40, or, or, or whatever. And then after 20 that, to 30, you're, yeah. you're going to eat up the 10 inches that you got for free uh -huh. um, in, in 20. That's right. Three is going to be exhausted. Yeah. And, and, and then, and then I, don't know, and I don't know what they're going to do after that. So let's say I use my 10 for next year, and then I use another 10 the next year, another 10 the next year. Now I'm at negative numbers, right? Like I've used up all of my water now do i have to stop irrigating my trees i mean we, we you know there's there's a lot of unanswered questions this is very early mm -hmm. but it's coming very fast like they're they're our neighbors are implementing this rule this year starting october 21 is when they're starting to count the the usage mm -hmm. and and my my district 
has said, we're not going to do it till next year, October 22, but they're being pressured by the neighbors to come into it this year. So anyway, at the end of the day, they're going to take all this money and uh, they're, they're claiming that they're going to purchase uh, farmland and fallow it in order that, um, you know, With the overdraft. Yeah, to to bring the the GSA into balance, right? Because 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 how they how they calculate this is they they um, they calculate all of the inflows. So they have you know rain um, you know rainwater that lands on the dirt and sinks in. They've got Leaky. snow that is Snowpack. captured in the mountains and then runs through our channels. Mm-hmm. You know the 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 water that belongs in the district the water that's leaked into the you know that's leaked in the district say through conveyance that is losing water along the way right so they figure this out and so the and so they're measuring the inflows that way and then the outflows are measured using satellites yeah that's measure an, that's another topic <laughs> measuring et right so all so all these numbers yeah. by the way are, are not you know the numbers that i'm giving you are, are not the, these this these 10 inches 10 inches 10 inches those are actually 10 inches et not 10 inches applied okay that's important to know so it's not it's you know because there's there's an and and, and i don't know why they pick 10 maybe because they figure for every 12 inches that you apply the 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 plant will you know express 10 you know, so if it's 20, it's 80 percent system crop and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. 80 percent efficiency. I mean, I don't know where they came up with the number, but, you know, that. So but that's how they're doing it. Back so they're using donkey reference. That's where they came up with mm-hmm. the number. The donkey. Exactly. Yeah. They pulled it out of the donkey. Um, so, you know, I think that first 10, you know, what they call the the native yield or whatever. You know, I think there's some I don't know. I don't know where they come up with the 10, but. Anyway, that is what's going on here. So they're going to take that money and they're going to, you know, build infrastructure projects to bring and retain more water into the district. So, you know, b- building um, groundwater sinking basins so that during flood years, we can capture more recharge. of yep. recharge. We can recharge instead of letting it flow out the San Francisco Bay, we can capture more water here and, and keep it. Because during flood years, you know, even down here in the south part of the valley, the water runs north, you know, and and, and, and any gallon of water that runs north uh, from Fresno south is lost, right? So we can, if we can build the, the project, put in the projects to keep the water here, that's going to take some money. And then, and then, of course, like taking acres out of production, reduce what the satellite is looking at, right? Mm-hmm. So if, you know, it, it really comes down to like, the GSA's job is to get total in and total out to be the same. So how do you do that? You keep more in and you prevent more from going out. Right now they're like, everyone's going to have to cut. Well, not everyone's going to have to cut. I mean, some, you know, guys, I, I will tell you, I'll tell you the, what, what's going to result here is that a alfalfa is gone. Right. But I, I saw, I saw a map of every field in this uh, area, according to what the satellite is saying, and the ones that are the furthest, like the highest, highest ones are all alfalfa fields. Uh-huh. And so imagine paying 500 bucks an acre for water for alfalfa. Uh-huh. You know, I don't think that works. No. Um, you need a calculator for that too well. Yeah. So I, you know, the thing that's frustrating about all this is we've, we've, we've known this is a problem <coughs> for 20, 30 years. Okay. We got the legislation for the problem five or six years ago. Fourteen. And there's been a 14. there's been a lot of really wasn't that when it was passed? The In fourteen, yeah. Six years. Yeah. Was, so we've known it's there and there's just been a lot of feet dragging around it. It's like, eh, we don't know what to do, you know, and all this stuff. And honestly, there's there's models for this in Kansas, Nebraska, you know, throughout the Ogallala uh, system. Mm-hmm. on what to do you know texas are just like ah pump it we don't care you know the rest of the states are are trying to monitor or limit restrict no new well drilling only so much per well per year if you overdraft mm-hmm. here you have to offset it somewhere else yada yada but you know honestly 
it's uh, it's some of our fault too for letting the problem go along as long as we have, and just thinking it's we just go deeper, 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 and no consequences. I I totally agree. You know, I mean, I I, I, I don't mean to make anybody mad, but hey, come on, <laughs> you can't you cannot argue unlimited. You, it's you not cannot unlimited. argue. No, it's not. It's not unlimited. And you know, and as much as we, you know, and and I would, uh, I, and I like to say that. It's it's difficult for Californians, right? Because if you're in, if you're over the Ogallala, um, you know that all the water that falls on the Midwest, right, is going. You know, it's, the Ogallala is going to get charged by rainfall. It's all pretty much going to end up. You know, whatever whatever's going to run to the rivers runs to the rivers. Whatever runs down and get and soaks in gets soaked in. But in California. You know, we, we have a much more intensive management program for water, right? right? And and we could be recharging, we could have been recharging our groundwater with water that we are letting go to the ocean, right? But we're letting it go to save fish, and it's not helping to save the fish. So that exactly. Is awesome. So so I you know I think some of the head burying right is is a bit of like, you know, there, there, we've, we've spent a lot of time trying to argue just to keep the water, right? right. Just to keep the water that's, that we're, you know, let's not just throw it away, right? So first, you know, we have to, we want to stop throwing the water away before we have to sacrifice. You know, we're being asked to sacrifice and the, we wouldn't have to sacrifice if they were just you know, yeah, we need to do both. Right. Uh, you know, the thing that's frustrating about the, the letting it go for environmental reasons is that it doesn't seem to be improving the situation. To me, that's what's the most frustrating. I think it'd be don't you think it'd be a completely different argument if there was some positive ecosystem services benefits to the water? <laughs> and I mean, totally been going on for. 15 years and we haven't seen it right oh man it's been you know yeah at least you know i mean i you know I, exactly so you know I, and, and i mean to be, have a <clears throat> livelihood we want you know fish to not go extinct absolutely but right if it's we not all that difference then yes but there's ways to do it you know there, there are alternatives right like for example we want to restore salmon run right mm -hmm. well you know Restoring salmon run is very, very difficult to do, but you know what's easy? Trucking the salmon, right? Like you could just pick them up, put them in a truck, and take them where they want to go, right? Or the airplane and, thing, the videos of them releasing out of the airplane, that is the coolest thing ever. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's there's all kinds of ways, and, and I'm no expert in that particular area, right? But I, but you know, the, the point of this bit of the conversation is really about our attitude right the, right. the, the californian attitude about groundwater is that we we never viewed groundwater as a, fi a finite resource because we've watched this you know because we know it's not right it's like we have infinite amounts of water if we were just to put our minds to managing the water that we have right and it's certainly not infinite but it's enough it's enough, you know, and and so when we get hit by these droughts, um, it's tough. And when we have these flood years, we let it go because we don't have enough storage because of environmental concerns. We don't have enough conveyance. We don't, you know, we have all these all this red tape and bureaucracy in the way. So you know, it's it's it is certainly a gigantic quagmire. Well, um, it's going to continue to be a quagmire. And um, bureaucracy uh, is expanding because the expanding needs of the bureaucracy, you know, and it, it will mm -hmm. continue to to be that way. Unfortunately, it just seem kind of seems the cycle of man is that way. And, and the other thing that frustrates me too is I think there's there's other things behind the scenes um, that you know people just don't want farming in the Central Valley. They want it returned to you know more native types of things. And you know, so there's always, always agendas behind everything instead of just trying to, you know, create a great life for, for everybody where we can all get along in a balanced way. So, okay, we're not going to solve this, Dino, but it's important for everybody to be aware <clears throat> that this is going to greatly drive uh, food prices, many of the foods that can only be raised in California and, uh, and the high quality that can be raised. Or it provides opportunities for people to once again, grow crops that used to be grown in other areas of the country that have migrated to California because of the climate and the water and the, and the labor. And if the labor yeah. 
and, and the climate and the water are no longer there, all of a sudden those economics change and things move again. So yeah, you know, it's it, it's all ever, just nothing's ever <clears throat> stable, right? You know, I mean, I think we're all going to survive, right? I mean, to some degree, it'll just be it, different. It, it, it's going to be different, but but I do think that um, it's it's going to become increasingly more difficult for small family farms uh, in California, and that you know the 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 large vertically integrated right. um, farming companies are going yeah. to are the going to requirements the regulatory <clears throat> stat the, yes the it's, overhead to do businesses yes california agriculture is going nowhere the california family farmer you know on their way to extinction that's a you know that's a point it's an unfortunate point but that's regulations always tend to favor yeah. the large ones so well you know they do that on purpose We're taking a short break to share that the Ag Emerge podcast is brought to you by the team at Ag Solutions Network. Rooted in innovation, ASN is committed to leaving the land better than we found it, not simply maintaining it. We're here to help you navigate the balancing act of productivity and building a legacy. From practices to products, ASN is more than a new jug. It's a new way of thinking. So don't be afraid to be different be afraid to be the same. Contact Ag Solutions Network today at asn.farm. And now back to our show. All right. I want to talk a little more now about something that's um, really, really neat that you and your boys have been up to, the Giacomazzi uh, Brothers Nut Company. Mm -hmm. This is pretty interesting what you're doing. Talk about what the boys are up to, what your motivation was behind it. It, This is is pretty neat what you got going on. Well, um, you know, my, my kids um, are, are, first of all, my kids are not really growing up farm kids. You know, they, uh, we live in town and, um, you know, they're, they are resistant to coming out and getting dirty. And, uh, and so, you know, I've, I've taken a bit of a different approach than my dad took with me, you know, because uh, I was forced to work at a very young age. I resented it. I hated agriculture. I hated farming. I hated being around here. And I left for, you know, 13 years after college before I came back. And so I thought, you know, I don't want to raise my children to resent me and resent farming. So I'm going to see if there's some other way to do this, you know, and, and, you know, they're just to the age now where they're getting old enough to start, you know, doing something. And they're, you know, they were eight, they were, they were seven and 12 at the time, but they're, um, when, when COVID happened, um, and their school was shut down, they were, you know, the school just shut down, right? Like in, in the beginning, there was no, you know, homeschooling, you know, they didn't know what to do. They just shut down. They're just like, don't come don't call us. We'll call you. Right. It was just, and so they were sitting at home for like a month with nothing to do. And and except they were just playing Roblox all day. Right. And uh, so, so one day I go home and I'm like, all right, boys, uh, you get two choices. You can either come to work with me uh, with a shovel uh, and a quad and go to work on the farm, or you can figure out a way to sell almonds and so they uh, immediately decided that they were going to figure out a way to sell almonds. wasn't even a the wasn't even a question. Quad do it, huh? It, well, because they get to drive the quad for free, right? Like they, oh, you know, yeah. they they get they get to come out here and drive the quad whenever they want. Like it doesn't have to, you know, make make work out of driving the quad. But um, anyway, so they um, so lucky uh, for us, uh, a, a, um, a good friend of our family. Had, had had at the time recently <coughs> acquired uh, equipment to flavor almonds and pistachios. Mm-hmm. And so we uh, worked with them uh, in coming up with flavors that, you know, um, kids would like. And, uh, and, and they came out and, and the kids came out with these products. So essentially what they came up with and, and oh, and there's an important part of the story. My kids don't eat almonds. They, they are almond farmers <clears throat> they don't eat almonds they they think they're boring and um 
but but it, you know to be fair they don't eat much of anything else either like they, their diets are very very limited like they eat goldfish crackers they eat popcorn uh you know they eat gogurt sometimes you know no meat um no dairy like they're just really narrow they're you know so um anyway so they thought well if we could make these almonds into something that we like maybe other kids would too so what they came up with was like they like they liked goldfish they like cheetos so they made a cheetos flavored almond and they you know they um and then we came up with flavors that are churros so they're kind of like snickerdoodle churros a cinnamon based almond they have one that's tastes like a glazed donut um they have one that um that wasn't really it was someone else's idea and 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 it turned out to be one of our most popular things but it's a sweet sriracha flavored almond mm. and then we and then we eventually made a blazing hot cheeto almond and um and in addition to that we have two almond butters that are flavored one is a birthday cake flavored almond butter and one is a jalapeno popper flavored almond butter. So they, but we started out with about 20 different flavors. And, um, and what was fun was then, then we took and we sent samples of those flavors to 40 different families that we knew all around the country that had kids and not had kids. And, and we did Zoom um, taste testing with them. Yeah. And, and so, um, you know, the, the boys managed the entire thing. Like they had to, you know, they, 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 they came up with all these flavors. They, they worked on getting them made. Uh, they, they sent out all the samples. They, they, they managed the zooms and, and kept track of all the data, you know, and, 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 and essentially decided to sell the flavors that we have based on the feedback they got from, you know, a hundred and something wait a minute, people. Wait a you mean you ask a customer what they want and give it to them versus just make something and expect <laughs> them to buy it? <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Hold, well, hold it this is not farm related right. yes maybe not farm related that's something i think we're ter- yeah. notorious about with farmers right we we grow yes. a commodity and expect somebody to buy it and we build a commodity group around it and we advertise 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 and push for policy and it's like maybe we should just talk to families about what they want yeah give the people what they, they want i them. heard that See, somewhere in, yeah insights and they're seven and twelve <laughs> yeah so yeah. You know, so we started selling them online. Um, you know, they they worked on setting up this website, you know, a little Shopify account, and and um, and then you know that Christmas we ca- they came up with a uh, Christmas gift box, and uh, we sold you know a couple hundred uh, you know gift boxes, and uh, and, that and was their nineteen Christmas. That was nineteen. Nineteen. We did it in nineteen, and then we did it in twenty. Then COVID hit in twenty. No, 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 no. It was in 20 because 19, we, we didn't do it in 19. We started it in, and we started it in, um, basically they released, they released the, we opened the website in June of 20. We okay. started in March, right? Yeah. We started in March of 20. So we've only had one Christmas and it was Christmas of 20. We have Christmas 21 coming up and they're working on a new gift box, um, it's the same stuff, but, a you know, an upgraded box, it's got their logo printed on it and stuff like that. You know, it's a, yeah. it's a fancier, fancy, fancier box. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, then, then, um, then we started doing farmer's markets, um, this year mm-hmm. and, uh, and, and, and this farmer's market experience has been really amazing for them, I think, because they're, um, almost all of their sales have been online. So their whole experience has been, you know, posting stuff on Facebook, showing up at the office and packing and shipping, you know, boxes, no connection to yeah, no, no direct connection with people. No, but you know, and, and I'm always kind of hammering on them about like messaging, right. I'm like, you know, we, we've got to find what's in it for them. Right. Like why would a mom buy this? You know, and I tell them things like, you know, a mom, all she wants is something that her kid will eat that has protein in it. They could put in the lunchbox, you know? And, um, and so when we go to the farmer's markets, they're listening to moms talk to the kids saying, you like that? Would you, will you eat it if I buy it? Can I, you know, will you eat it if I, if I send it with you to school? Right. And, and the, and, and my boys are like, Oh my God, that mom is like you, she's saying our messaging right to her kid. Like they're so excited that, uh, you know, they're, they're, 
that the ideas that we have about why people would buy the product mm -hmm. are actually working, you know, that, it, that it's actually um, true, right? That, that what, that we can find a problem to solve for people with their product, right? And um, so, you know, it's been really great, really fun. GBnuts.com, by the way. GBnuts. GB there you go. GBnuts. Is it, I love it. That's that's easier than spelling out Giacomazzi Brothers. It's also GiacomazziBrothers.com, but you Good. can get there with GBnuts.com for sure. All the domains. Yep. <laughs> we got a, We got a whole bunch of domains. Yes. <laughs> All the different ways you can accidentally spell Giacomazzi Brothers. We have those too. There you go. And so what do the boys learn? They've learned about what the customers want and what the messaging <laughs> is. Uh, they've, they've seen that whole order fulfillment process and they've done web developing, social media posts. They've done marketing and management. I mean, what a great, um, uh, they probably learned more in that than they would have in the month off from school anyway. I mean, oh, absolutely. practical stuff that they've learned. What other things that they learned? Well, you know, I think what uh, I mean, they, they're, they're learning about, um, you know, supply restrictions, <laughs> yeah, There you, go. <laughs> you know, like packaging, right? Packaging, yeah, things probably a packaging, you, get it, getting getting cardboard boxes is not an easy thing to do right now. No. Getting uh, getting stickers to put on the packaging is not an easy thing to do right now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're they're looking, they're, they're experiencing inflation, you know, um, every, everything that we're doing is costing more the, yep. the time, the time to get stuff is taking longer. You know, they're, they're learning that you can't just decide today that we want product next week. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it takes, and so you have to plan and, and, um, and time inventory is <clears throat> dead these days. It's so. dead, completely dead. I don't know who you invented know? that, but they, uh, should be hauled out back and shot now, but the Japanese did that. Know, yeah. The Toyota, um, but, uh, Anyway, Kaisen, they call it the, the, but the thing is that what, you know, but what they're really learning in my, what I'm really hoping to instill on these kids is that my, I'm the fourth generation of this family and for four generations, and let's just leave my great grandfather out of this because I'm sure he was doing what we're doing. Okay. Because he was direct marketing. Yep in 1893 because that's what all there was okay he would make cheese and butter put it on a wagon drag it with the horse into the town of hanford and sell it to the chinese rail workers that is that is how this business got started mm -hmm. but my but my life my father's life and my grandfather's life all they were ever concerned about is how to lower the cost of making milk just production <clears throat> how do you get more milk for less money Mm -hmm. That's the only part of the equation that we had any control over. So it's always the only thing we ever thought of, you know, and, and, and what I want my kids to be thinking of is how do we increase the top line mm -hmm. more than thinking about how do we decrease the bottom line, right? Because we know increasing, decreasing the bottom line is entirely about scale. Correct. You know? There, there's there's a minimal amount of efficiency that you get out of being smart. And then the rest of it is about freaking scale, right? So you either scale up the bottom line or you or you scale up the top line, right? So this and is- How this, do you scale up that top line? And, and that's by listening to your customers, right? And giving them right. what they want. Yes. Isn't that what they want. the number one way to do top line? It's the only way. Oh, actually, that's not true. You could actually lobby the government to build a motor around your business and give you regulations free, that no one free, else free, <clears throat> free, free money and, you know, things like that. That's another way to do well, it. What have you and Julie taken away from this? I mean, it's just been a wonderful learning experience for your kids. I mean, what, what are you guys taking away from seeing them grow and, and, and do this? Oh, boy. Well, you know, I mean, you got to be proud. <clears throat> Well, we're proud of them, you know, but, you know, like it's, you know, trust me, this is not like all uh, butterflies and leprechauns for these kids, right? Like, you know, the, the, the one day, one day it started to look like work to them, right? And and, and it went from being like, oh, cool, we're going to go do the almonds to like, oh, damn, we have to go do the almonds, right? And, <laughs> and, and so, so, you know, watching them work through that and, and, uh, and, and seeing that they're capable of, uh, you know, doing what's hard sometimes, you know, doing, doing what needs to be done, even though they don't want to, Yeah. you know, is, um, 
is important. And, and I think that this is a, you know, so now, now I'm actually in a spot right now where I'm having to look at this thing going, okay, so now am I, am I, my dad with my son and you know, with me again, forcing them to come and do this work. Right. But, but I'll, I'll tell you the thing that really pisses them off my kids is they're like, when do we get paid? And I'm like, what do you mean? You're reinvesting all your money back in the business. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to business ownership. Uh, oh man. Yeah. So they're, they're trying to figure out when they get paid. I'm like, you know, we got to We got to scale it up boys. And so anyway, we're, well, that, them, that's some neat ideas that other people listening to this can maybe take a, take a cue from what you're doing. If maybe there's a, maybe there's a crop that you're raising now, uh, something that you can do, you know, just even a corn farmer, simply hand picking yes. corn, taking it to a farmer's market, offering it for sale for squirrel feed, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, they, three years for a buck, you know, or planting some sweet corn or, or taking tomatoes or, or any type of thing. It's a great opportunity for, for your kids to learn how to be an entrepreneur, learn how to business, learn, learn how to uh, work. And that, yes, the business, uh, you know, when do I get paid? Right. And, uh, <laughs> so, I mean, that's a great opportunity. Wouldn't you encourage anybody to, to do that with their kids to, to uh, absolutely, man. Business? You know what? It, it's so, I mean, I, I, I hope this is the right thing to do. You know, I don't know, but I think, helping this younger generation view farming not from the perspective of a commodity producer is the best thing we can do Bingo. you know and and i think that they're all in a position to do it because they live in a world that is so foreign to us you know we we don't even understand all the ways they can succeed that that they have access to that we don't even know exist right and and so they're they're going to come at it much differently if we just give them the rope to do it, you know? So dad has made that transition from a dairy farmer to a farmer. Now the sons are making the transition from a farmer mentality to a, um, entrepreneur. They want an entrepreneur, create mm-hmm. a product that people want and I'll, and connect them to the farm. Yeah. So it's an interesting transition. I, I love that story and how that's, how that's coming together over time. So we'll, we're going to be watching for when they go public, Dino. Yeah, we're going to we're going to take them public. Idea. We're going to take them public with a spec. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be the nut spec. The nut spec. The nut spec. Yeah. I see. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Speak, speaking of nut spec, our, our next our next plan, what we're working on is um, we're we're uh, we, we've we finished removing all the corrals, uh, you know, the, the hardware from the corrals and the dairy and have been trying to figure out what to do with, you know, what that land was. Mm-hmm. And 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 ironically, a big chunk of it, we're going to put up fences and plant pasture and put cows back on it. Mm-hmm. Um but 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 a good little chunk of it, we're looking at uh, doing an ag tourism thing and and doing the corn maze, pumpkin patch, and um, you know having uh, a little stand where the kids can sell nuts, you know, all year long, right? We want and well, and the packaging on your nuts, you could have a vending machine right there with a minute, you know, twenty four exactly, and come up and mm-hmm. buy a pack. So that's right. 24 seven drive by, you know, and we're, and we're in a really good spot because we're right next to a busy highway and you can see it from there. So, you know, that's, uh, I think an even better opportunity, you know, for them, it's just being able to be part of the community and offering that, you know, access to the farm, offering access to the farm to, you know, lots of people in our community that don't know farming. Right. I mean, we, we live in a totally ag community, but a a town of 55,000 people, in a, in a county whose number one employer is government. And, and um, you know, and it's a military community and it's a prison community. And, and, and most people in my county are totally disconnected from agriculture. Mm-hmm. You know, e- even though agriculture is our only product, right? Mm-hmm. Other than, you know, government. Yeah. So it's a, it's a, you know, anyway, so I think having, you know, uh, 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 ha- having them participate in a way to bring their community onto the farm is I think another, another good, you know, so, so that it goes both ways, right. So that they not only can hear what the, what the consumer has to say, but the consumer can come and understand what they have to do too. Well, what else should we have talked about today that maybe I didn't hit? 
I think we, we've we've hit some great topics. Well, we didn't talk about cover crops. Once you, go, I mean, you, you, oh. you I, I can't, I can't imagine you having a. Uh, how are you going to have a podcast without talk? Isn't this the cover crop podcast? Oh, it's not. Isn't that? Huh? It's, it's, the, it's soil health and emerging technologies and uh, encouraging farmers and cover crops direct marketing yeah. and cover crops. <laughs> we need to talk about this. So now with the groundwater basin. Um, we we're finishing on a happy note with the DB nuts and everything. And we're mm-hmm. now we're going to go back to water, but that's going to go back to water. Yeah. Around water. Okay. So those painful decisions, when all of a sudden they cut your water supply in half, cover crops become on the chopping block. What do we do? It's a, it's a very <coughs> thing. I mean, well managed cover crops can be very, very low ET and the mm-hmm. reference satellite imaging for ET on cover crops. I would really question because they just don't have the data set to work off of. But right, very little. If you, as long as you don't grow jungles, right? Uh, Et is extraordinarily low, and and your buddy uh, Jeff, the winner of the official Jeff Mitchell Award, uh, yes, sir, has, has data that shows that basically the improvements in um, lack of surface evaporation because of the mulch cover, mm-hmm. and the improvements of water infiltration. So when you do get those 1.4 inch water events, mm-hmm. it soaks in where it hits instead of runs out and eventually tails off to somewhere it's not wanted. Uh, there's definitely gains there, but it's just but. awfully hard to see that I'm going to plant that. I'm going to spend three inches to water it. You know, how am I going to get my money back on that? Right. Well, you know, the problem, the, the problem isn't about getting the money back. The problem is convincing the satellite, right. That, uh, that your cover crop isn't using water. Correct. Right. Because, because when you're, when you're growing a 36 inch, 36 to 40 inch almond crop, and they're only giving you 30 inches of water. Mm-hmm. Um, if that cover crop takes one inch, uh, according to the satellite, then right. now I'm really only down to 29 inches, right? And I'm and already going to... Sh- doesn't take into account that water balance as far as <laughs> filtration, nor yeah. does it take in that water balance as far as lack of evaporation. No, nope. it, it doesn't care. And and when I look at the map and click on my fields, it says almonds, right? It doesn't say almonds with cover crop because, right. you know, they're they're assuming, you know, an efficiency number based on some standard, you know, university almond number about what, you know, the efficient use of water is in a almond tree. We have no problem with that because we can make trees show a great NDVI image, but be more water use efficient. So we were actually, one of our customers was at the, um, was a test program for it. And on our site, it was eight inches off because the leaves were more reflective NDVI, healthier, but it was more water use efficient. Mm -hmm. So they thought he had used eight to, or maybe it's 10 inches more water than what he had actually applied. (coughs) So that's a problem. Yeah, it's a problem. Where where is that balance? uh, So satellite measurement's part of the problem. Where are you at on it? What do you think? Where am I at on what? On the cover crop thing. I mean, you've surely seen the infiltration improvements. I would. Well, I have. I mean, I mean, you know, we, we just started, you know, um, I mean, we've done intermittently done cover crop stuff for a while, but you know, I, I have a particular problem in my water that is best solved with cover crops. You know, I mean, cover crop is the best opportunity for me, Mm -hmm. but I, I just canceled my cover crop plan because because of the balancing issue. Yes, because I don't know what they're going to do, right? I don't know what they're going to do. Like, like I cannot risk right now planting a cover crop and, and having it count against me until they have settled the cover crop issue, mm-hmm. right? So, you know, we are, we are bumping up against two conflicting um, objectives mm-hmm. by the state of California. They have... They have a very um, present desire to reduce groundwater usage, mm-hmm. but they also have a very, very big uh, uh, program. You know, this, the California Department of Food and Agriculture so- Healthy Soils Initiative is their number one talking point. Right. It is their most important thing. Storing carbon mm-hmm. is all California wants to do. Store carbon and stop using water. Well, those are not necessarily... Um, those oh, actually are is required. Those are polar opposites. Yes, those, but they're, but they're perfectly symmetrical. You know, they 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 help each other, but it requires thinking, 
right? It requires thinking to arrive at how they work together. And, and that kind of thinking doesn't work when you're trapped in a silo, right? When, when your one silo says, stop using water, and the other silo says, we need to plant cover crops, uh, and those two silos have no, you know, uh, they have no knowledge that the other silo even is there. You know, this is this is the this is this is what has been going on in California for my entire life. Right. These these independent uh, and unaccountable uh, bureaucracies who, who and it only happens in California, Dino. It doesn't happen. Well, in any it, of the other does, states it, or it does. It does around the world. You know. <laughs> It it I I have um, I have been to many other states and countries, and and they it 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 happens here in a way that it California doesn't happen. Fast at it. We we are we are better at it. We we are so good at this. Nobody can compete, right? Like we are we are the you know uh, Muhammad Ali of regulators, right? We are the goat, but. You know, I, I I don't I don't I don't discount anybody else's regulatory problems, but uh, we have a special version of it here. You're a special sort of, well, <laughs> special sort of crazy. There you go. We are a special sort of crazy. They don't call us the land of the fruits and nuts for nothing, right? Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you know those are things where we're relying on a technology that's supposedly more uh, accurate than flow meters and less labor intense and by using the NDVI imaging, but they're certainly also at shortfalls too. And it, it needs to be tweaked for that. And well, and I, and I think they're going to allow for, you know, people to report, um, you know, like we've got meters on everything. I mean, every, every, well, every pump I own has meters. They're all hooked up to a automated automation system. That's, you know, we're, we're, you know, we, we built, um, we built our irrigation systems to be, you know, beyond highly efficient. You know, we, we, we took, we took drip irrigation and we tried to figure out how do we, how do we make drip irrigation even better, you know, yeah. and, and irrigate by zone. And, you know, we started doing the zone irrigating and then kind of discovered over time that the zone irrigating wasn't really that big of a benefit to us because, you know, our zones aren't that extreme. Maybe they're not as extreme as we thought. Um, but what automation allowed us to do was to irrigate at a high frequency, you know, and, and so, you know, irrigating, irrigating seven days a week or 14 times a week or 21 times a week, you know, sometimes and fertigating 21 times a week, you know, we, we think, um, can generate some benefit, you know, during certain times of the year, you know, and, uh, and, and can increase our water efficiency, you know? Um, so, you know, the, the, so we, you know, we put in all this technology, we did some of it on grants, we did some of it, you know, on our own, mm -hmm. but, uh, so, you know, so we have the ability to ground truth, you know, the, uh, the satellite data. So we'll have to see moving forward, you know, what happens. Mm -hmm. Um, but there, there's a lot we don't know yet. We, we just know that the, that the panic has has arrived, and we have a meeting coming up in November, and we're we're we're, we're we got a sponsor to you know pay for a barbecue, and we're gonna you know we're gonna um, make people check their weapons at the door, and uh, you know we're gonna <laughs> and we're gonna well. see if we can get through it. We just hope we can find some wisdom in everything because we, we need to change. Uh, we need to do better. Uh, just finding what the right thing is to do better versus having something forced down on us that is that is not <clears throat> accomplishing it, you know, costing a lot without accomplishing it. That's that's what's the most frustrating. Yeah. So. Well, and, and going back to something you said earlier about, you know, this is needed to happen. I mean, look, there is, I don't think there's a single farmer in this valley that doesn't want their farm to be left for their kids and their grandkids, right? There's not a single farmer in this valley that doesn't want species protection, habitat preservation, open land. You know, I mean, we want all the things that, you know, the liberal regulators want, right? We, we just want to be practical 
about our approaches to, you know, protecting our future. And, and so, you know, I, I think that we, we will eventually get over the shock of this, you know, radical change and, and start looking at how, how to, how to survive, you know, how, how to make it work. But we're, we're going to go through, I'll tell you, and all the crazy things I've lived through in my, you know, 20 year career as a dairy farmer, living through tons of regulations and dairy, this is probably 10 times bigger than all of it combined you know it's going to radically transform everything we do mm -hmm. really quickly and and it's going to you know it's going to be um, a fun thing to experience because it's not going to be boring i don't know if it'll be fun uh, <laughs> it's going to be a uh, uh different <clears throat> thing to experience and a uh, it's, it's it's the kind of fun it's the kind of Thinking. It's, the, it's the kind of fun you have when you go to the haunted house, right? This is, uh, you know, a, a practically a Halloween episode here. So I'm thinking about, you know, the uh, it's fun like that. Yeah. There you go. It's fun like a like a head wound is fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Dino, I really uh, I really appreciate your time today. Uh, it's exciting to hear transitions you and your family have all been through, and and how you're looking to the future and realize that change is coming and and need to address it. I think it's great what the boys are up to with dbnuts.com. Go there. GB, GB. GB. Sorry, Jack, Jack and brothers. So Jack Jacomazzi with a G. We'll have the um, the whole uh, listing in the podcast notes. So go uh, over perfect. some uh, some gift um, boxes for this year, folks. Mm -hmm. Ship nationwide, right? We ship nationwide. There you go. They'll get you all taken care of. Yeah, we uh, ship we ship nationwide and to Illinois. Oh, very good. So you you mm -hmm. ship to the 49th uh, most regulated mm -hmm. state. So yes, mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> but I uh, I really appreciate it, and uh, we've known each other for for a long time, and uh, it's it's interesting to see how farming's changed over those 20 some years we've known each other. So that's right. It'll be uh, fun to see what the next 20 years has in store for us. So that's for sure. Well, just we'll, like yeah, just like a head wound. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be the quote for the podcast Kim. Mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> all right well thank you dino you have a wonderful day and thanks for joining us thanks monty take care we hope you've enjoyed this podcast today if there's one thing we know it's that there's no silver bullet for solving the challenges we are seeing in agriculture today but what we do know is that there's a lot of great folks willing to work together to find solutions by looking at things differently and as always, if you'd like to find out more about what we're doing to help growers implement soil health practices, check out our website at asn.farm. And there you can click on the links to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn. There's a lot of great things happening and always something to learn. Thanks for listening.